here's the formula that we use. By building this product for this customer, we believe they'll get this benefit. And we'll know it when we see this metric. So if we say there's customers out there that have problem X, great. We're going to put things in the roadmap that benefit the customer. And here's how we think it's going to benefit them. Not let's try to paint it blue because maybe blue is more attractive than red. But here's the problem they have. And here's how we will know if we're solving it or not. You need to have a clear statement about that for everything you put on the product roadmap. Alan has started and grown several multi-million dollar businesses. His mission is to help you do the same. Welcome to the Business Growth Pod, building the future one entrepreneur at a time. Hey everyone, welcome to the Business Growth Pod. I'm your host, Alan Draper. Happy to be here today. I'm excited for our guest. Before we get to him, make sure that you hit the subscribe button on whatever platform or follow, whatever it is, whatever platform you listen to this podcast on. Also, let me know how I'm doing. You can leave me a review or you can also send me a message. Go to my website, alantraper.com. Let me know what type of guests will be helpful for you in starting your businesses. What type of questions you have, hurdles that you're running into as entrepreneurs getting started. Today, I'm excited to welcome David Subar. David is the founder and managing partner of Interna. He works with technology companies to improve their product management and engineering to be more effective. He's worked with really large corporations, including the Walt Disney Company. We're excited to have him and we're excited to learn from him. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about your background. I want to hear about your history, whatever you think is relative to our entrepreneur listener in terms of how you became an entrepreneur, your experience with Interna, and just you know, take me whatever direction you think is most appropriate there. Yeah. So I started my career doing research and development in artificial intelligence and machine learning hmm. and working in a military owned think tank. But what we produced was papers. We didn't build stuff. And so to the extent that some paper, someone might hear one of the papers or read one of the papers, and it might affect what they built later, you know, we might have an effect on the world or not. Hmm. I, I found that to be, well, it's frustrating, mm-hmm. frustrating to do a bunch of work and then not have it, you know, live out in the world. I wasn't a scientist. It wasn't hmm. built to be a scientist. So from there, I became an engineer, a software developer at technology companies and went higher and higher up the management chain, eventually becoming CTO of companies, chief technology officer, and then running product too. And and the advantage of running product and technology is you got to envision the product and lead the teams that helped figure out the marketplace and helped figure out what was on the roadmap and built the thing and got it released and then see how the market reacted to it and do it again and again. And that was the opposite of doing research and development. That was really driving building technology products to change markets. And so did that for quite a long time. And then about nine years ago, started Interna, which is helping other companies through that same journey. How do you have teams that can envision the product, write the product roadmap, understand the strategy? How do you have teams that have engineers that build the software, that builds the product? How do you do that quickly so you use capital effectively and learn from the market? and then be able to iterate. How do you get product market fit faster? And so Interna helps other companies do that. Yeah, that's, you know, I, I'm i almost done with this book. Author is Patrick Lincioni, and it's The Six Geniuses or something like that. And in the book, he's basically talking about how our different personalities affect our performance at work. The idea behind it is there's six different categories that people can be really good at. For example, visionary. I'm trying to remember all the terms, but you know, the person that sees the mission through, the person that one's an inventor. And I think it's interesting because you talked about how early in your career, at some point in your career, you didn't feel like, you know, you had the personality of a quote unquote scientist, which I think would fall into the inventor genius. And it made you want to change your career path. And as you're helping these companies with their products, with development, implementation, 
and helping them through these different stages. Do you take into consideration specific team members? Are you advising them to that granular level or are you just a larger scope? You come in and just move kind of larger pieces around with them. The answer is both and you have to do both. So you have to understand what the company's trying to get accomplished, who the customers are, who the competitors are. You've got to understand who are the people in the organization? Who are they? What do they do? You have to understand what are the processes they work with. And then from the software side, you have to understand the architecture. What are they building? All of those either create leverage or impede building a successful product, building a successful company. And so one of the things that we do, we have four services we do. One is we'll do a deep dive into product management engineering and come back and say, here's the things that you need your product management engineering team to do well. Here's how they're performing on each of them. So maybe call it red, yellow, green. Here's why they're red, yellow, or green. And here's what you should do. And that could be your recruiting process is broken or your org design is wrong, which, you know, either of those might mean you're the wrong people in the wrong seats or you're the right people in the wrong seats. The way product management engineering talk to each other is wrong. The way what they're focused on is wrong. How they align with sales and the CEO is wrong. Or they may be right. And so you have to understand all of those to say, is the team likely to build a successful product and how will you now? That's interesting that you have that type of perspective. That seems like it would be very valuable because, you know, as entrepreneurs and business owners, it's really common for us to, you know, I say that my greatest successes and my largest failures have been with people and getting the right people on the bus, getting the right people in the right seats. And a lot of times it requires this outsider, right? This consultant or this person that isn't in the day-to-day and can see things differently. It's like with my kids, I have 10 and 8-year-old boys and a 4-year-old daughter and we'll go see family that we hadn't seen, you know, in a couple of months and they'll say, "Oh, your son's so tall." And I don't see it because I see him every day. Right. And so tell me a little bit about what entrepreneurs can do to keep kind of a fresh perspective. How can they, outside of obviously retaining your services, which sounds like it's very valuable and would give them a great leg up, but before they get to you, what are some things that they can do to view their businesses, the situations, their processes with new eyes so that they can kind of put you know, some of their knowledge and experience into it before you come on board to offer that perspective? Yeah. So it is hard. When you're talking about the philosopher Satyana said, I don't know who discovered water, but it probably wasn't a fish, right? Exactly. I like that. So, I like that. Yeah. So here's how I mean, obviously you proc managing engineering, that's what we do. Obviously you could talk to us, glad to have that conversation. Do you have as a CEO, as a founder, do you have a peer group of founders and CEOs who you can come and say, I'm having this problem. What do you think? And there's groups that do this, that bring CEOs. It's not something we do. Bring CEOs and founders together so they can have those conversations. That won't let you see inside the company, but it'll let you get perspective on some of your decisions. And it also depends on the relationship with the executives that work for the CEO. What are those like? I know someone who's CEO of a major retail chain, and he has an executive that he very much trusts and is very open with. And that person gives him perspective, but that's also a little bit fraught because the other executives may know about that relationship. It's hard to have outside perspective when you're inside. Hmm. It's very, very hard. Bill Gates used to do these week-long discovery journeys where he would just leave Microsoft and go a week without anybody else and just read and think. Mm. That's another option, right? But, you know, it's just hard to have outside perspective when you are the ultimate insider the founder or the CEO. I mean, that's an interesting comment about Bill Gates because the way that he gets, you know, that perspective on some level is he has to remove himself from it, right? The analogy would be if like, I didn't see my son for a week, right? And then, that's okay, right. I can see kind of some of the differences. And I think it's so important for us to view our businesses with fresh eyes. And I think your services, 
other, you know, business consultants or coaches, I think that's one of the best values that they can bring to the table is, hey, look at this area. Maybe there's some room for improvement there, or maybe, you know, you have these ideas in your head about what your customers think about your product, but they're not actually what your customers think about your product. And, you know, I think that's such a great value add. What are some things, and I'm talking mostly about more early stage, smaller organizations or startups. What are some things that you see them really struggle with in seeing about their business or their people? What is what is kind of something that's more common in the earlier stages? Some of those mistakes that are more commonly made that you're able to go into a business and say, oh, well, you know, this is kind of a staple mistake that early entrepreneurs make. Anything come to mind? Yeah, there's a few things. One is people fall in love with their solutions as opposed to falling in love with the problem they're solving. It's not like I'm going to build a doghouse and paint it blue and no one's seen blue doghouses before. And so everyone's going to buy a blue doghouse. It's what's the problem you're solving? Who do you solve it for? It's falling in love with the problem, falling in love with the customer. And Mm. maybe it should be aqua. Maybe it should be, you know, light blue. Who knows? But it's not about the blue doghouse. It's about Mm. I'm here to serve this kind of customer. And we're going to iterate on that problem quickly until we figure it out. That's problem A. Problem B is the flavor of the day problem. Oh, it's a blue doghouse. No, maybe it's red. Maybe it's orange. Maybe it's green. And so you have to come with a thesis of here's who we serve. Here's the problem we have. Here's how we're going to do it. And here are the steps we're going to take. We're not going to just arbitrarily pivot every day. We're going to be thoughtful about it. We're going to measure it. And so we often see talk management engineering groups that are flailing from idea A to idea B to idea C without a reason. And then the last thing is the thing that you said before, I say it slightly differently, is 90% of your problems are solved by hire well, retain well, and fire well. And you got to do all three of those. Well. And fire well, by the way, is the hardest of the three. And people make mistakes on all of those, all three. Hmm. That's incredible feedback. I mean, that's, I love this idea of not falling in love with the solution. And I think you're right. I think most entrepreneurs, we start off on this path of, you know, we're open-minded to some extent. And I think some of it comes from this idea that as businesses, you know, one of the first questions we get asked, whether it's from a potential partner, a customer, a potential investor, whatever it is, our spouses, whatever, is, well, what problem do you solve, right? What do you offer the world that isn't currently being offered? It's a great question. And you're saying you, you know, this is not necessarily something wrong, inherently wrong with that question, but an entrepreneur can get too hung up on the solution and lose, you know, the forest for the trees type of thing, right? We're not focused on the customer. The customer changes over time, right? And if we're so focused on like hammering this peg into this hole, whatever it is, it's like, hey, what are we doing this for? I think that's a really great idea. What do entrepreneurs do about it? What's a practice that they can employ to make sure that their focus is right? Because, and then the second thing you said was, I think, equally important. So on one hand, like, how do we make sure our focus is correct? And then on the other How do we make sure we're not changing it all the time? Because as entrepreneurs, we are terrible at that. It's like we have the squirrel syndrome where it's like, wait, that, oh, that's a good idea. Oh, maybe we should do that. So how do entrepreneurs kind of address those issues? I think it's fundamentally starting by saying, here's what we believe the market is. Here's who we believe the people are. And here's the problem. And every product that you build should address those questions. And here's the formula that we use by building this product. For this customer, we believe they'll get this benefit, and we'll know it when we see this metric move. So if we say there's customers out there that have problem X, great. We're going to put things in the roadmap that benefit the customer, and here's how we think it's going to benefit them. Not let's try to paint it blue because maybe blue is more attractive than red, but here's the problem they have, and here's how we will know if we're solving it or not. You need to have a clear statement about that 
for everything you put on the product roadmap. Clay Christensen had this thing. He had this concept of jobs to be done. And Clay Christensen, if you never read any of his books, he's brilliant. He's got a few books, definitely worth reading all of them. Is that The Inventor's Dilemma? No. Innovator's Dilemma was one of them. Innovator's Dilemma, yep. Yeah, exactly right. They went to McDonald's. They were working with McDonald's. He was a professor in Harvard's business school. And they went to McDonald's and they were helping McDonald's and people were buying vanilla shakes at nine in the morning. That seems curious. Mm -hmm. Vanilla shakes, delicious thing. Not so good for you, but delicious. But why would you have one at nine in the morning? And McDonald's couldn't figure it out. It turns out that the vanilla shake at nine in the morning solves a job is people were on the commute. They were hungry. They didn't have time for breakfast and they didn't want something that spilled on them in the car on their way to work. And so understanding that, now you can design other food that might work for them. You can broaden their menu if you mm. understand what it was they were trying to do. And so it's always about the customer. It's always about the problem they have. And I feel like I'm just quoting a bunch of people. But Draper said, the job of a company is to create customers. Revenue is a side effect of that. Mm. I mean, that's such a great perspective for entrepreneurs to have. How do they monitor it? What are, because one of the core components of a business is that it evolves. And if it doesn't evolve, it dies. And it, it needs to evolve because economies change, people change, technology changes. How does an entrepreneur monitor or measure or become aware of somehow changes that need to be made because their customer base or some other facet of their market is changing. Yeah, and you're right. Markets and customers change all the time. Actually, by entering a market and creating a solution, you are changing the market, right? And so you have to go back at first principles and understand the customer and understand their needs very frequently. You don't do it every day, mm -hmm. but you know, I would suggest once a quarter to go and try to understand where you are, what the customers are, or what's changed, what the competitors are. SWOT analyses are one way to do it. There's worthy maps. There's other techniques to understand what the customers are. And then you ask yourself, do we or do we not want to change? Because maybe there's changes that aren't important. Maybe there's market segments that you're not interested in, right? But you have to go and understand. It's sometimes a place where having a third party is helpful, mm -hmm. but not always necessary to help you understand. Also, just monitoring the metrics of the business. Mm -hmm. And the metrics may be financial metrics. They might be usage metrics. Changes that are up or down or consistent are both interesting. Oh, we're selling a lot more of this than we, than we did before. That's interesting. What happened? You know, did we do something that was successful? Did something else happen? Do we do something by accident? Did the market change? Or things are going down. Gee, what happened? There's a whole process called retrospective where you can understand those processes. One of the things actually, when we analyze, it's one of the things that we look at is looking at trend lines and what happens to be thoughtful about it. I mentioned that the deep dive we do, oftentimes companies after we do the deep dive will say, can you help us get to the next step? And so we'll coach the CTO or chief product officer, or we'll work as interim CTO and get the groups to the next step to get them there. But that also is often is a process of how do you put that process of periodically checking in and seeing how you're doing as part of the process. Every time you do a product release, after the release, you need to say, did this product do for the market what we expected to do? But if a product's been on the market for a long time and hasn't had significant changes, you need to regularly go back and say, how is the product line doing in general? And by the way, you're going to trade shows, you're reading a bunch of stuff online or whatever. You should be attuned to what's going on. You should be talking to customers. Once again, it's empathy with the customer and empathy with the problem. Hmm. Have you run into a scenario where you get hired and contracted and you go in and you find that one of the issues is the leadership of the business not being willing to adapt to change? And if, if that has happened before, or if not, what do you recommend? A lot of times entrepreneurs and business owners, especially when we've been around a while, we feel like we have all the answers. And I was just having a conversation a couple of hours ago with one of my partners. And this idea of effectuating change just didn't resonate with him, even though it's very clear that we need to do something differently. How do you get an entrepreneur to, whether they agree with your idea or not, just open up their mind to 
you know, the possibility of some change? Well, so first you have to identify if the entrepreneur is right, or for me, if I'm right. If I think that they're heading into over a cliff, I've got to identify that. And I find the best way is by asking questions. Telling an entrepreneur everything the world's going to come to an end, sometimes it's successful, but it's often not. Mm -hmm. But say, you know, well, actually, let's talk, take Google and generative AI, right? Stuff chat they're doing with chat GPT that's going on that's changing the way people seek information. Now, Google's very aware of this. And Google's very aware that their market has just changed. But if they weren't, I would walk up to their CEO, if they were to be my client, and I would say, do you think ChatGPT is a useful information source? Or do you think customers perceive it as a useful information source? And then invariably, the CEO would say, let's just say the CEO said yes. What do you think people think about Google search as a useful information source, invariably, would say yes. How do you think chat GPT as an information source will change how customers come to Google, right? And exploring by a series of questions what it is. If the CEO says, no, chat GPT is not a useful information source, or people don't perceive it as a useful information source. Oh, that's interesting. It seems to be getting a lot of press. Why do you think that? Or do you think it might change? No, it could be the CEO I'm talking to has information I don't have. Hmm. And that's interesting. Now I've learned something. And I'm going to back off. What I have is broad knowledge, not deep knowledge. I don't know about a particular CEO's market, but I've seen a lot of companies over nine years of doing this. And so I can ask questions that I can pattern match and I can ask questions of other patterns that I've seen and that together we can discover if they need to be open to more things or not. Hmm. I love that. And I think it's such an important part of the entrepreneurial journey is to ask questions, to have an open mind. And, you know, a lot of times entrepreneurs, they have, you know, deeply founded beliefs about something, but it's not in data. It's just, you know, that's the way things have always been. And that's the way things are always going to be. And, I think one of the greatest attributes of successful entrepreneurs is the ability to question and say, okay, this is what I think it is, but why do I think that? And what are the other alternatives? And it's not something that we need to be doing on a nonstop basis. Otherwise, we wouldn't accomplish anything, right? We'd just be questioning right. things all the time. And so the flip side of that is the entrepreneur has to say, okay, with the information that I have, and the advice that I've received and the research that I've conducted, this is the best course of action for our business. And we are going to follow this course until we receive contrary information, whatever the case is. And that's okay. such an important part of that journey. Well, David, this has been fantastic. It's clear that, you know, you would be an asset to any business. Where can people, where can they go to learn more about what you guys are doing at Interna and how you can help them? So our website is www.interna.com. Interna is like the word internal without the L, I-N-T-E-R-N-A.com. You can hit me up on LinkedIn. So David Subar, my last name is like Subaru without the U, S-U-B-A-R. If someone just has questions they want to ask, they don't have to engage our services. They just like, hey, I just need to spend a few minutes on the phone with someone. Just hit me up. You know, you can you can find me on the website. You can find me on LinkedIn. And I'm D Subar like almost everywhere on the internet. So D like David and Subar like my last name. So glad just be helpful. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, David. And we wish you nothing but the best. Thank you. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave us a rating. And for daily inspiration and business tips, follow Alan on Instagram. Until next time, remember, we build the future one entrepreneur at a time. <laughs>